one of the most powerful aspects of OKRs is learning. The quarter cycle provides you every 90 days with an opportunity to learn what you should have measured to get to better outcomes, what your real capacity to execute is, and what gets in the way. And that quarterly cadence presents you an opportunity to see what always gets in your way, the systemic things that hold your team back and slow down your best outcomes. And that quarter cycle then offers you an opportunity to incorporate what you've learned into the next cycle. Now, that learning can't be shortcutted. You won't get it right and then never learn anything again. You're going to learn more about each of those things every quarter. And that helps you get sharper at prioritizing what really matters, better at removing the permanent obstacles in your way, and smarter and smarter about what to measure and how to measure value every single quarter. Lean into and embrace that opportunity to learn every 90 days. Now, there are some things you can learn in doing OKRs that you don't really want to learn, that you're better off borrowing from other organizations' mistakes and their learnings. And I want to focus on six of those. The first is confusing quality and quantity. The purpose of OKRs, of course, is to focus on the few things that matter most. And so the quality of your key results is far more important than the quantity. Avoid the laundry list. Zoom in instead on what are the real drivers of your outcomes at the end of the year and focus on those drivers this quarter. And don't confuse good ideas and good work with your best possible results. There are many worthy uses of time, but they don't all have the same importance right now and for this quarter. KRs, unlike KPIs, key results are the measures we want to improve in the quarter. KPIs are the things we want to monitor. So focus in on the needles you want to move and how far you want to move them this quarter and focus on the fewer, most important, that drive your end of year outcomes or drive your strategic outcomes three years from now. Focus on the drivers. The next is when you use OKRs, instead of breaking through the silos, they just reinforce the silos. In other words, you align straight down the org structure and don't spend any time making sure you're aligned across teams. Lateral alignment is often more powerful for unlocking companies' outcomes than vertical alignment. Now, don't wait for somebody to come solve the lateral alignment problem for you. As you're setting OKRs with your team and as you're doing them, think about who do you have dependencies with? Who do you need to work in cooperation with in order to achieve the organization's best outcomes? And go meet with those peer teams. Don't assume they agree with your choices. Go debate it with them and get agreement on the target key results. In other words, you take an active role in lateral alignment to make sure that rather than reinforcing the silos, your OKRs are helping you bust through those and break through to better results. The next is, and this is often a mistake that senior leaders make, and in particular, those that have used MBOs in the past, where they're used to writing the team's goals and handing them out. Now, if you use OKRs as a one-way information flow, you're missing a lot of information. They're really an opportunity for two-way information flow. So your people, the people both on your direct team and deeper in your org, know what the constraints and facts are that will cause you to miss the results you want to achieve. They know way before you do what those potential barriers and issues are. And when you include them as you set team OKRs and you listen to what they have to say about constraints and the risks and the pitfalls, you have an opportunity to address those things. So when you set OKRs together, you can actually build in and take action on those things that are likely to come up later in the process. You want to hear from them. So too, when you align OKRs into the organization, 
and the OKRs three levels from you don't actually tie off with your outcomes because they don't have the capacity, because they have more constraints than you're aware of, or because they're aware of risk you're not, instead of telling them to do it anyway, take the time to have the conversation, to work it out and to listen and learn so that you're getting information up to you in leadership role and they're getting heard and they have a safe way to surface those issues. You'll all do better as a function of that. The next way that things go wrong and learnings that happen over the course is that you avoid the real work of alignment. Well, the real work of alignment is a set of messy debates where you hash out what you really, really intend to accomplish and you discuss and you trade off what best possible outcomes really are and are not. And that takes time and it takes a, a conversation that's a back and forth. And very often leaders especially want that to be fast and easy. We're just gonna list them out. We don't even really need to talk about it. You do really need to talk about it because without talking about it, you have a whole set of assumptions right below the surface that everybody's really operating on. And you don't actually open those up and look at them and see whether they're shared assumptions. So this mistake happens for three reasons. One, avoiding those conversations. So you list everything because you don't want to actually have the hard hash out conversation about what you can't do and what you should do. So now you have a long list of key results. The priorities still aren't clear. Or you didn't take the team with you. You understood what the priorities were. You understood what the key results were and what the objectives were, but the team still doesn't. So you understand what to go execute on the strategy. They don't, you're not really aligned. And then the third, probably the biggest sin is leaders who decide I'm too important and I have too much uh, other things to do to actually spend my time aligning and executing on the strategy. That work happens down there in the organization. But aligning on the strategy, driving ownership and accountability for it and executing against it is the actual work of leaders in the organization. You don't have anything more important to do. The next learning you don't want is measuring tail lights and being able to see where you've just been, but not having the headlights to drive. So you wanna use key results to reduce your risk of failure, to optimize for your outcomes, not tell you what they are at the end. Think about what the real drivers are. Use the key results to shine a bright light on the ground in front of you, so you know when to accelerate, when to put on the gas, when to make a left or right turn to avoid a pothole. Think about your key results, not as end of period financial measures or end of period outcomes. Think of them instead as guides to the decisions you're gonna make week to week and month to month to optimize your outcomes. It's data that will help you achieve the strategy in the long run. If at, you're at the senior leader level and your key results are end of period outcomes, then make sure that your directs are actually the headlights to those outcomes and make sure that you're paying attention to them and so are they. The next mistake that leaders make, and it's often just the first OKR cycle, but that's managing key results at the wrong elevation. So they're sitting at an L1 or an L2 or level one or level two leader in the organization. And they've got a long laundry list of key results, which are really the activity that they want somebody three layers below them to do. And when you pull them up at your level, a couple things happen. But the worst problem there is, it looks like you're managing them and that creates confusion over the people that, for the people that really need to manage them. Who really owns those outcomes? Is it you, is it them? And you need them to have the clarity that they own them. In fact, that's why you're doing OKR. So each team is clear about the outcomes they own at their level and at their team. Now, a rule of thumb to help avoid this mistake and avoid this learning is that the key results at your team level should be the key results that you will actively discuss at least twice a month 
in your staff meeting. And when you look at that list and you say, well, we wouldn't really talk about this and we don't need to talk about that. You either have somebody else's key results at your level or you have the wrong agenda in your staff meeting. The key results should be the ones you are going to manage to directly week in, week out, month in, month out to optimize your outcomes in the quarter. And the last mistake or learning that you don't need and that you can borrow from elsewhere is don't let the process eclipse its purpose. When you are probably more importantly, when the people who are running the process for you lose sight of the power of objectives and key results to align on outcomes and drive our focus and high attention to them. And they default instead to bureaucracy and update for the sake of update, you lose. You don't need OKRs. You need more clarity and more focus on the most important outcomes for the business this year. And no one else needs to do OKRs, but everyone wants clarity, alignment, focus, and success on your objectives and key results. OKRs, the acronym, are a means to get there. They aren't the end unto themselves. They're the means. Hopefully that helps you have more success this year.